It is a great pleasure I have now to sort of look across the dining room table and see this marvellous man. <laughs> I've known him for years, Marty and, Smith. And you sound just the same. Well, you look the same and you sound the same. Well, I'm not, None the, of sa- us. not the same inside. <laughs> come a bit closer to the Where microphone. Where would you like? It's closer? Yeah, come a little bit closer. I don't know if you're having... You're only having water there, but would you like a glass of wine? No, or? thank you. I don't drink at all these days. Oh, golly. Nothing. I so remember the uh, occasional lunch at which I was privileged to uh, attend. I didn't get lots of invitations, but I remember you were a... Uh, uh, um, what was it? Green chartreuse you used to love. Yes, I did. <laughs> it was always an easy present. <laughs> Christmas birthdays, people knew. Yeah. Just get the green chartreuse. Yeah, yeah. I'd line the bottles up. And, uh, oh, Anyway, God. eventually it all... It was all drunk. Well, as I, I, long as it didn't go to waste... Well, well um, that's, that's... It was good at the time. And I remember meeting your wonderful mother and father who were so supportive of me when I when first came, came over came here. Over, yes. And, yeah. And we went to your house... At Millswood, I remember one night, yes. and we had bacon rind. Oh, yeah, because that's that's uh, Kari, my first wife, yes. used to do that. It was and apparently I'd a never Norwegian. Had just exclusively an entree of a bacon, bacon rind. rind. Well, the Norwegians are funny people. They never waste anything. They uh, eat absolutely everything. Was, I can still remember it. It yeah, was scrumptious. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yes. I would say probably very bad for the heart. Oh, yes, I'm sure it was, <laughs> but... At that time, I never even... Heart no. wasn't in vo- my vocabulary no. No. then. we didn't. No, they were wonderful days in a sense that they were kind of carefree. I and tell, I tell you, mention that because I, I haven't written it yet for the advertiser, but I'm. it's the next article, major article to write for the newspaper, is I went back last Saturday morning mm. to my original childhood home. Huh? Where was it? In Northgate Street, Unley Park. Oh, what a lovely spot. I love that street. Well, it was up the poor end. Oh, no, no, it's the a whole very, street. In fact, not the poor end, <laughs> the very poor end. The whole street's but I, nice. I just had been wanting to do this for some some time yeah. and I thought I don't know whether it's the right thing to do. Why? To, to go back, you know, will they welcome you? And I thought, well, they're either going to say get away Oh. You know, and ringing the bell the Saturday before the referendum, they might well have thought <laughs> this, this guy is trouble. Yeah. Um, but no, a delightful, I think, probably just recently retired couple. Mm. And, um, I mean, they won't be named in the article and mm. I won't give out the exact address of the house. But for me, it was lovely to go back and even, you know, in the middle of the day, mm. not... Not exactly believe I was in touch with ghosts or mm. people of my past, but my bedroom was still there, Jeremy. Yeah. And they've got a couch where I used to sleep. Yeah. So I lay down on the couch and she's taken photos yeah. from the paper of me supposedly sleeping yeah. in the yeah. same spot. Exactly. You're going to put that in the paper? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. How, how old were you when you left that house? Well, I left in 1976 and I was born in 1947, so you do the maths. That was 29. Yes. Isn't it? Yep, yep, yep. 29. Yep, 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 yep. So you you left that house in 76? Yes. And 76 was the year I came over from Sydney. Yes, I left at the end of 76. And and, and you and Paul Linkson brought me over very kindly and enabled me to have um, the wonderful life that I've enjoyed here ever since. I was just telling Martin who I think sat here before. Yes, he did, yes. That I was responsible for you to come to Adelaide. (laughs) You got the blame. He wanted to know a lot more. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All those marvellous chapters in your life, Uh, because you, apart from being producer... Of course there's a book in it, Jeremy, but you, you can't write a book because... Why? If you told the truth, you'd be in so much trouble. Would you? Yes, you would. You would. And I, oh. if I wrote a book, I can write articles. I can do bits here and there, you know, and play around with it and exaggerate a little yeah. bit and pull back where I have to and make sure no one gets into trouble, including me. Yeah. But a book requires, you know, a go-to-woe story. Yeah. And 
I don't think the lawyers would... Oh, uh, well, lawyers are not exactly the most fun-loving people, No, well, you'd have really. to run it past the lawyer. But if I do it as I have been doing it now with the advertiser for two years, piece by piece, yes. and telling my story publicly, really for the first time... Yes. Um, you know where all the bodies are buried? I'm quite sure of that. Well, perhaps they know where I should be buried too. You no, know? no, 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 no. It works no. both ways. People, so. people would know you from the last word and the mouthing off and uh, all of that and the stories that you write mm. in the advertising. Yes, they do, which is it's terribly humbling. Yeah, but you like uh, print journalism better than radio journalism? I, well, for the last 40 years I do because yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. been my occupation. Yeah. Um, and it's not work. I mean, don't let's hope the tax office isn't listening. But you slave over a typewriter or of a word processor I write, or I something. I love writing, and I'm told at my age, I'm told, and I accept this as a compliment. Yeah. I'm writing probably as well as anybody. Oh, at my God, age yes, that, yes. You know, people seem to know. Which, but you, you, know, you say. Which is you, kind of freaky. But you say people of your age, you're younger than me. Yeah, not by more, oh, well, more than a year or two. Or I, 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 I reckon that you have to be yeah. a certain age before you really know what you're doing. Well, this this new lady came in as editor of The Advertiser almost two years ago. Yeah. She's delightful, Gemma Jones. Mm. Absolutely It's delightful. a nice name, Gemma Jones. Gemma yeah, Jones, yeah. it's good. And she is nice. She's mm. awfully nice. Almost like she's the president of my fan club. Okay. You know, which is... <laughs> You know, I'll accept it all yeah, day, yeah. every day. God, yes. But she said to me, because I'd been in hospital a fair bit with different problems, and I wrote a piece about being in hospital. Yeah. And she said to me, you can write. Yeah. I said, well, I won an award in year one at school <laughs> for writing about dinosaurs. Long before they were trendy, <laughs> I wrote about dinosaurs and I got the prize. Good boy. And... She said, I think you should write for us. Mm. And I said, oh, I, you know, if anything I'm winding down, if anything. Mm. She said, no, I want you to, to, to start writing properly. Yeah. I mean, what I write in the daily column and the quiz on the weekend, it's not writing, Jeremy. It's just... You know, oh, I find it most entertaining. It's entertaining, but it's yeah. not writing. It's just thoughts, you know, it's just... They're not sentences or, you know, it's not creative in the terms of prose, you know. Oh, well, I don't know. Anyone but anyway, she, she said, I want you to start doing hmm. for us. Well, so how, how, how much do you have to do uh, every month or every year, apart from your column, which is every day? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's flexible. I've got an agreement with the paper which allows me to write whenever I want for whatever length I want. Yeah, good. And on whatever I want. Now, not many journalists have got that freedom. No. And I, I'm thrilled. I'm, I've got this chance to, you know, put my life story into the paper, as I say, yes. chapter by chapter, if you like. Yes. Without, you know... Being offensive, I mean, I'm trying to be, make them fun and yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but you've got, you've got this. It's all a game, Jim. It's all sure. a game. Uh, but it, it's uh, just another wonderful branch of entertainment, really. When people sit down to read a paper, I'm sure there are some of us left who do. Uh, <coughs> you know, I don't know whether. Well, I've got, you know, you read the paper now online and you yeah. whatever, but you still read. You know what yeah, yeah. we write, but you write the stuff. <coughs> you might, you might just look at something and uh, get a lead for a story. You might find some simple little thing that we would uh, overlook or not pay too much attention to, and you can make a whole story out of that. Oh, you can make it up. <laughs> well, no, it's just having imagination, you know, isn't well, it? Well, uh, you, you know, I don't mind exaggerating if it proves a point. Yeah, I, th I think that's quite legitimate. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to go out of your way to be obnoxiously untruthful. No, you no. Know, I don't. I think there are journalists who, no. you know, trade on that. No. Uh, true, true. One of the things I really like about you is you're a people person. 
Yes, I think I think I always have been. You 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 you, you can. I don't know whether it's summing people up or it's uh, the ability to kind of spot talent or whatever. But I remember, um, gee whiz, I think when when I came over here, Gary Bow mm. was my producer, and there was a young man, very young, called uh, Paul Flanagan, mm. and it became terribly obvious to me that uh, uh, Paul was just remarkably gifted as a producer, brilliant in fact. And I'm sure you saw the same thing too because it wasn't long before Paul was producing the program rather than just assisting and that was just a a wonderful uh, advantage for me. I've always liked talking to people in an individual sense. I mean, unlike you, you talk to the world. Um, oh, I talk, I just loved talking to interesting people, and I yeah. happen to find everybody no, no, interesting. No, no, in terms, I meant in the world, meaning listeners. Yes, yes. Oh, I, I see. I, I'm more interested in just, you know, going out to lunch and shooting the breeze, and yeah. coming home and thinking, well, you know, that was time well spent. Yes, and it probably was. It was. Yes. I mean, yesterday I went to lunch with the a guy I wrote about only four or five weeks ago. Mm. He's the Somalia. Mm. At uh, Fishbank, the restaurant in the city, oh, yeah. he's twenty-four years old, and yes. he's, he, you know, quite remarkable. Yes, and we had lunch yesterday, and I told him stuff about me that he didn't know, and he told me stuff about him I didn't know. Hmm. But when we went our own way at three o'clock, I thought, okay, I've I've, I've enjoyed this, and yeah. I, I don't want to necessarily learn. No. But I want to just come away with a smile on my face and two people have connected. Yes. Or two or more people if necessary. But yes, yes. I, my ideal, I don't never have liked big groups. No. Ever. You know, I just... You're not a joiner? Well, I can. Yeah. You know, I'm not stupid. I, you know, I don't turn down an invitation if no. I know there's going to be 20 <laughs> people there. But I get the feeling, though, that uh, if it was a team, you'd be in it as long as you were leading it? Um, I don't, not now. Because mm. now I'm just a cog in a wheel at the advertiser. Doesn't sound like it to me. It sounds like you've got the carte blanche. You can do what you like. Well, I work from home and, yeah. you know, I've got good friends in there who support me through ill health and through good work. Yeah. Um, but I don't know whether these days I would fit in with... You know, being in a newsroom, mm. I think yeah. that's asking too much of me now. Yeah. Um, now, when I was program manager of 5DN, I suppose I had responsibility for mm. 30, 40 people. Well, you were the best program manager that I'd ever Old worked Jordan, for. Went, no. You, you don't have to, you know. No, I, I, I do. I just point out the, uh, the bleeding obvious from my well, own no, personal other, experience. other great program managers. Who have done much better than me? I well, can I, you. I guess I just wasn't privileged to meet them, but um, you well, know, I I, 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 I just have heard of them. Well, I haven't worked at too many radio stations. No, really. well, I haven't either. No. Um, but I'm aware, you know, of people who have given their whole life to to a radio station, yeah, and you know, made it. Yeah. In their market, the number one station, not perhaps forever, but yeah, 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 sure. They've planted all the ideas and they've yeah. grown, and uh, mainly, I would have to say, probably mainly music stations. Yeah, much easier to turn around <laughs> than, than the station at the Five DN here, which I inherited as program manager. Yeah, that and was, and turned around. That was a dinosaur when I took oh. it over. Yeah, yeah, but you you uh, kind of. Put the round peg in the round hole and the square peg in the well, square hole. Took, a lot of people find that very difficult took, to do. It took two and two years and the best part of two years to get the right people doing the right things. And we missed along the way. We missed with some people. Yeah, they, there were, they didn't stick around. There was a bit of trouble with breakfast. There I was remember, a lot of trouble with breakfast. I remember Conic Flakes. I didn't know. Well, there was another guy <laughs> called Michael Lynch who came. Yeah. From, I, I, I did learn, I think... And, of course, it doesn't matter now because I'm not involved. But I learned then that it was kind of fatal to take 
somebody from the ABC to commercial radio. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But at the time yeah. it felt right. But, you know, they, they never really yeah. uh, turned themselves into a commercial animal. I think it's uh, – fancy that, looking down the dates, which I, I <coughs> have for years kept – Marty, I don't know if you recognise them. <laughs> These were the ones you gave me uh, at 5DN 40... I'm sure I sold them to you, Jeremy. I didn't. Oh, oh yeah, well, that was afterwards. <laughs> oh, that's probably true, but you used to give them to me when <laughs> yes, I was... Yes, I, I know, I tried to help. But just, just speaking of the ABC, um, 1981, Ralph Bain started at 5DN doing breakfast. Oh, there's a name. There's a name. Well, I'd gone then. I'd, oh, I'd I see. left. He wasn't anything to do with me. Right, I right. would not have done that. No, I, I remember Ralph. He was, a, I think, a very funny man. But I don't know that it worked, and I don't know why it doesn't well, it work. Did. Well, I learned the hard way. I mean, we brought a couple of people over from Melbourne, from the ABC in Melbourne, and we. Yeah. I don't think we took anybody locally, but they they were brainwashed by the ABC before they got to us. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. And no matter how much you tried to you know, prod them or kick them up the bum or whatever, you know, to, to be commercially creative. Yeah. It was just instinctively wrong to them because they'd <laughs> been with the government for too we, long. We were the devil. <laughs> we were the evil ones. But it was all fun. Yeah. Jeremy, it was all fun. I mean, obviously, like any job, you have good days and yep. you have bad days and you have very good days and you have very bad days. You remember the best day? When I left? Oh, was it that bad? No, it wasn't that bad, but I, I'm being a bit frivolous, but I was ready to do other mm. things. Which included television and all kinds of... I went of... to television from, from five yep, yep. years. Mike Willisey? Mike Willisey, yes. Yeah. yes. And you went to Sydney and... Uh... I lived in Sydney for nearly four years. Yeah. Enjoyed it? I love Sydney, always have. I used to visit Sydney a lot because of relatives and, indeed, I'd made connections with people in Sydney radio and Sydney television long before I went there to live. But I would not like... I mean, now Sydney's changed. I mean, this is 44 years ago. Yes. Um, I wouldn't want to live and have to spend, you know, four hours on the train or the no, bus in the no, morning no, no, to no, get no. to where I had to work. No, it's a different place. I'm glad I got out when I, yeah. I did because I, like you, have got very pleasant memories of Sydney, but I know it, it, it's a Sydney that doesn't exist today. Um, tell me the story about uh, KG. Um, I, I heard that you found him and he was um, reading gas meters or something. Not when I found him. He'd, he'd graduated from, from gas reading meters. gas meters. Yes. <laughs> he was, when I found him, he was the um, manager of the Newmarket Hotel ah. on the corner of North Terrace and West Terrace. Yeah. Um, I'd, ever since I'd first went to America, which was 1969, Yeah, I was aware of at least one station in every big market devoting themselves to sport as entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I filed that away and I thought one day it might be useful. Mm. One day. Anyway, when I was given the job as program manager of 5DN, I... Um, thought now's the time mm. to see what happens here. And you mentioned earlier the manager, Paul Inkson, yes. who had no affinity for sport whatsoever. No, I, I'm absolutely you know, with him. He, he yeah. knew a lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. But he, he, he didn't know anything no, I don't about get sport. It. I don't get it. <laughs> and I won't say that I knew much more, mm. but I knew enough Mm -hmm. that this was worth a gamble. Yeah. And he said, mm, as he was, very theatrical, no, 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 no. I remember. We're not going to do that. No, 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 no. No, 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 I no. I said, well, look, let me go to America one more time. Yeah. Not just for this, but to look at and listen to radio generally. Yeah. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll support that, which he did. Yeah. And... Uh, First thing I did when I get off the plane was to go to these sports stations right. and 
well, not go to them necessarily first up, but certainly to listen to them. Sure. And they were mainly built around baseball and American football, yeah. not as we would here in Australia, certainly in winter, mainly be Australian rules, but we would do all sports, yeah, yeah. all sports. Anyway, I was in America, I think, for five or six weeks and I'd made my mind up that if I couldn't do it at 5DN, I would go somewhere else and do it. You were invested in it to that extent? It was a winner. Wow, It okay. was a winner because it was not being done in Australia. Well, you've got to believe in Anywhere. something. Yeah. Not even 3UZ in Melbourne, which was a very important sports radio station. Mm. They weren't doing it. They mm. did it long after we did it here mm. in Italy. Mm. Um, and they asked me how to do it, <laughs> which was... Satisfying. Very flattering. <laughs> um, anyway, I come back and I said to Paul, we've got, to, we've got to do this. And he said, this is a very long answer, Jeremy, to your no, question. No, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, uh, he said to me, well, who are we going to get to do it? And I said, oh, I've got some ideas. But I said, I won't. We won't do names today. We'll I'll just leave it with me. Mm-hmm. And... I talked to two other people who were based here in Adelaide and they weren't interested before Mm. I talked to Ken Cunningham. Mm. Ken didn't know that at that stage. I think he would have been a little bit hurt. No, I think he'd be very grateful. No, 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 that I talked to somebody else. Oh, well, you were opening the door. They'd turned it down. So Ken was third on the list. So one afternoon I called up the hotel. I knew where he worked. And I said who I was and I said I need to come and talk to you. Mm. And I can't remember whether he said come today or tomorrow but it, it, it didn't take long and I was down at the hotel. And I said, okay, here's the deal. We'll start very small, mm-hmm. maybe only half an hour a day mm. and we'll just see what happens because I said we've got a very apprehensive boss <laughs> who doesn't think it's going to work. But I said, I think it will, and if we start at half an hour, then we can, Yes. you know, we've got the leverage. It's to, logical, to yeah. Move. yeah. Uh, anyway, Ken had to obviously go home and talk to Sandra, his wife. Understandable, of course. And, and also he was on the verge, I think, of being chosen for some some sporting position with the South Australian Cricket Association, oh, yeah. either as a player or, or something. I can't recall that. Yeah, umpire, maybe. Um, but anyway, he got back to me and he said he, he thought it was worth another meeting. And I said, I know it is. Mm. So we did and the rest, as they say, is history. And what was the first survey like? You must have... Uh, for, for, well, for the people on air, uh, I, I, I understand the... Uh, a torturous nature of waiting for those figures oh, well, when they would come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the executives too, there were you, heavily invested in this gamble. And, and you remember when the ratings came out no. that morning? No, I don't. But you were, you were confident that that'd be good? Yeah. Did, was it the sort of show that built or was it an instant success? I can't remember. I can't either. I mean, it wasn't an instant failure, that's no. for sure. Oh, sure. It grew. Um, it and did. I gave Ken a producer. Who I'd known for a long time. Who was that? Young man called Guy Dunstan. I remember Guy Dunstan. Who yes. had a law degree and an economics degree, yeah. but he was a sports fanatic. Yes. So they had that in common. Where did you find him? I'd been a friend of mine through other friends for a long, long time. Isn't that funny? I mean, the mentoring part of uh, uh, your job would have been a very important one because you, you've got to pick the right talent. You got to. Ken pick... just loved him. Yeah. He and Guy just came together. They merged. Yeah. It was just a marriage made in heaven. Good. I couldn't have wished for anything more. I didn't have to worry. No, no, no. Because Ken was Ken had only done the football show and a few other bits and pieces on Channel Nine yeah. across the road that, those days from Five DN, and Channel Nine treated him very differently as a almost a freak. Yeah. <laughs> now, in his own way, Ken was, but. He had the makings of being a very responsible broadcaster and his his ability to talk to children mm-hmm. 
which no one knew about till we put him on the air and kids called him up. Mm. He was phenomenal in communicating with kids. Mm. Gift. Yeah, it was. Mm. It was. So, you know, the Ken, the KG story just grew. This is all 1970, either late 77 or... Yes, yes. Perhaps early 78, somewhere there anyway. But then it just grew and I remember saying to Ken, you better make the most of this because you've only got about seven years in this business. Yeah. And God damn it, he's still on the radio on Sunday <laughs> yes. mornings. Yes, oh, yes. Doing the same thing, and speaking be, the same language. Yeah, murdering the language. Yes, <laughs> but that's his style. style. Yes. Yeah. Channel 9 wanted to send him, when they realised we were onto something, they wanted to send him to elocution class. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't think this story's ever been told publicly. No. Um, maybe Ken has, I don't know. But. I remember Rick Boland was the program manager yeah. of Channel 9 and I liked Rick. He was yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I said, no, <laughs> that will destroy <laughs> Absolutely. him completely. Yeah. But he was adamant for a day or two there that Ken should learn how to dot every I and cross every T and put every, yeah. a G on every word. And I said, yeah. no, that's the least of our worries. No, you're going to ruin the spontaneity yeah. and the, and the, course, the natural I flow talk, of things. I talked Rick out of it. And I don't know whether it ever got to Ken, yeah. you know, that they were planning this, but I think Ken would have put his arms up in the air in horror and yeah. said, uh, I resist that, you know, I'm who I am. Because 5DN and uh, Channel 9 being directly opposite each other on 10th Street, uh, they had, a, I suppose, an ownership uh, connection when uh, Rupert Murdoch owned them both. Yes. But uh, it was a good working relationship that existed for years and years and years. Mm. I worked at Channel 9 in 1965 reading voiceover news. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, Were you tempted to stay in television rather than radio? Well, it certainly paid, at that stage in 1965, it paid about eight times better than radio. Oh, God, yes, yes. And, of course, still does (laughs) for most people. Yes. Well, there are uh, fewer televisions. John Doherty was the assistant manager. He was the first newsreader on Channel 9, on on television here in South Australia. Yeah. And I keep in touch with John. We have lunch. Yes, yes. Quite often. And he's now 89. Nice guy. Nice guy. His voice is still that honey, beautiful tone voice. That hasn't changed a bit. Of course, at 89, he's, he's not quite the same as he was, thank goodness. Um, but neither is the audience. You can grow up with your oh, audience. Well, John's been out of television now for a long, long time. Yes. But he's still keen to know from yeah, me, yep, yep. you know, who I know and what I'm doing. But I think of people like Brian Henderson, who was well into his 80s before he uh, decided to uh, hang it up. Um, I, I think there's a lot of things to be said for people who refuse to hang it up. But then again, that's something of a self. You've got to know when to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I suppose. Otherwise, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not just for the uh, but it's tragic. Movies. Marty Smith is with me. Stay right there. You're listening to the Court of Public Opinion with Jeremy Cordeaux, where the time is 11 a.m. Australian Central Standard Time. And the weather today in Adelaide, it will be a cloudy day. You may not find us on your TV, because in case you did not know, we're being brought to you by, brought to you by, brought to you by R-A-D-I, oh. We're searching for sunshine. We're looking for a friendly place, a silver lining, a happy face, a little grin in that open space, and a chance to say, have a happy day.
for people The kind who will invite us in To give a cheer for a home team win And share a laugh with the kith and kin And find time to say Have a happy day We're searching for good Do you want to make a real impact in your community? Sponsor Jeremy Cordo's The Court of Public Opinion and be a part of something special. Connect with engaged listeners, showcase your brand and support informed discussions. Yes, oh look, I've been loving watching it. It's uh, truly, it's a true breath of fresh air. Oh well, I'm glad you found me. Make your mark on Jeremy Cordo's The Court of Public Opinion where voices matter. Jeremy, I think it's wonderful that you're able to do this because you have such wonderful history. You have a great connection with your audience. There are still many, many, many people who love you and it's just great that you and others who may be in a similar position who aren't working for a commercial station anymore can do it and continue to do what they love doing and not just for you but for the listeners. Sponsorship opportunities are limited. Act now and be part of the conversation. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Simply visit jeremycordo.com and click on Sponsor. Marty Smith, the greatest producer I have known in my, well, my short life. I suppose he'll try and talk me out of saying that, but I believe it. Uh, we played that little Happy Day uh, jingle in there. And DN would have had that because it was part of the Macquarie Network for years and years and years, wasn't it? Have a happy day. Yeah. Yes. Sounds corny now, doesn't oh, it? Oh, I suppose it does, but it? it's kind of nostalgic when you oh, think... Oh, yes, it's an era. All the radio right. jingles, uh, we, I can't remember when I first came to DN whether they had jingles or not. No, I don't think we do. I think jingles were disappearing or had phased, been phased out. But they were a real art, weren't they, in their day? They mainly belonged on top 40 stations, I think. Yeah, I suppose. They yeah. were short, sharp... Frantic, yeah. you know, loud. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know quite why a talk station, as DN was becoming, yeah. would have needed a jingle. But I think I think I got rid of them, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, radio stations uh, in the 70s, 60s and 70s were sort of more like uh, kind of all all service stations. They did a little bit of everything. There'd be a... Uh, a bit of a talk show and there'd be, you know, when I, I remember 2GB having a, you know, a music breakfast program with John Martin and uh, they would have Andrea in the morning doing a talk sort of program. Uh, then there'd be an afternoon uh, chat show with Gordon Chater and Gwen mm. Plum or something. Yes, it took a long while to phase out the old and bring in the new. But then in the afternoon there would be John Laws doing a, a yeah, disc that's jockey program. what I mean, program. That all that in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Was, was like, I mean, Jeremy, the programs I inherited yeah. at 5DN here yeah. when I became program manager yeah. were really of an, another, not just another era, but yeah. another ice age. <laughs> I mean, we had things like Hawaii Calls. Hawaii Calls Hawaii what? Hawaii Calls. 30-minute <laughs> program of Hawaiian music. <laughs> Does anyone remember that? 0491 65 68 60, if you do. <laughs> and, but the, there was a whole plethora. Why Hawaii? <laughs> I, I, I don't know who sponsored it. I can't remember. And then we had, there was an Adelaide organist called Headley Smith. Lovely man. Yeah. But I inherited a 30-minute program called... Headley at the Hammond. <laughs> it was all this block programming. Yes. You know, and then you might have a 30-minute program of religious music. Yes. And it just yeah. all, not overnight, but it had to be swept under the carpet yeah. because it didn't, it didn't attract revenue. No. There was a thing called the Methodist Hour... Uh, which only went for 15 minutes. I could never figure that out. And, and indeed, with all respect, the, you know, the, the, the gentleman you replaced, yes. who was the Reverend Neil Adcock, yes. he, he had a very, you know, strong spiritual following. Yes, There's of no course. Doubt about yes, it. yes. Um, but it was wrong mm. in terms of attracting revenue. Yes. Um, I like Neil. I, I believe he's still alive and lives here in Adelaide. Um, oh, good, good, good. I only met him a few times. Yeah. Mel Cameron I knew for a little while. Well, Mel and, was an institution. Yeah. But but Mel is it was, true he died on a golf course? 
I don't think he died on the golf course. Bing Crosby did. Yeah, I heard right. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you gave me Mil- uh, Bing Crosby's phone number. Did I? You did. How did Bing, you... Bing must have been very cross. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was wonderful. Uh, no entourage, no uh, speak to my agent, I, no I, anything. I, it's his Jeremy, home number. I, I haven't thought of this for probably since the day it happened. Yeah. But you were on the day that Bing died, I think, or we put together or something. Well, we spoke to him very uh, yes. uh, but soon before. Do you recall who... I can't think who it was, but we... We called the same person twice in America Uh. and it was a good friend of Bing's. I can't remember, you know, like Donald O'Connor or someone like that. It was a good friend. Bob Hope. No, it wasn't Bob. I know that. Uh, But the second time you placed the call, this person didn't twig. They just went through the same answers and kindness that... They did the first time <laughs> an hour before. I can't remember who it was, but no. that, that was a mistake, of course, by oh, well. the producer more than anybody. No, well, look, you, you, you just had... The, you, I, we tweaked, obviously, in the control... I don't think I was there, but whoever was in the control, in the control room putting the calls through, yep. they tweaked and they must have said to you on your headphones, you know, just play along, this, yeah. we're doing all this again. <laughs> and you and this person, like, yeah. was a comedian of some sort. I can't remember. Yeah. But well, the, well, the call went ahead as if it was the first time yeah, for yeah. everything. Well, we, we had a lovely relationship with Kirk Douglas because as, as he got on, he, I'm sure he had a little bit of dementia. Yes. Uh, but he was very, very happy to talk to us any time. <laughs> We could ring him. Perhaps no one else <laughs> rang. Oh, possibly, because he, he was well into his 80s or 90s. Or, well, I don't he know. He was 100 and something when he died. When he died, yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I've got to ask you where you got the phone numbers, because you had this remarkable ability to get the phone numbers of the most hard-to-get celebrities. Yes, I did. I, I, it, was, it was just a, an act. Uh, yeah. Sorry, a knack. Yeah. Um, and I still sometimes go down that road. I know where I think I can find a phone number. I can't use it and I can't give it probably to anybody who can. But I quite like having My this God directory is. at home. Tell me, n- is it a Rolodex? Uh, how do you... No, it's, all, uh, it's just um, handwritten in a book. My God. Books. What a valuable book because a, a producer, his great strength or her great strength yes, but this, is, is contacts. Yes, but these numbers go out of... Day, oh, quickly. I suppose they do, and, you of course, the, the, the stars die. But yeah. there wasn't one major movie star or theatrical star. I think we ran out of people to read. We kind of did. Yeah. But uh, it, it was an amazing... But people loved that. Oh, yeah. It was the time when Don Lane... I loved it. Yeah. It was the time when Don Lane on Channel 9 was for the very first time yeah. doing satellite interviews yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on the Don Lane show. So the whole world was becoming smaller for the first time. But you got bigger names than they did. Oh, yes, probably did. Probably did. Um, but it was – it began as a gimmick. There's no doubt about it, you know. Oh, we are playing a game of It was an up. ingredient. It was an ingredient. Oh, yes, that, but that, that, you could overdo it because – Basically, a talk show should be local. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but we managed to blend that you, together you in three it. hours. I'll never forget, I – I was the first person to interview Neil Diamond in Australia. Wow. I did that in 1972 when I went to 5DN. I thought, blow it, I'll, I'll do the interview. No one else yeah. will do it. So I did it. And I've never forgotten to this day, we, I called him at his home in Malibu in California. Yeah. And I'll never forget to this day, the start of the conversation, when this this uh, it didn't go to air live, it was on a reel to reel tape. Yep, yep, yep. In 1972, probably a buyer tape recorder. Yeah, yeah. very old. Very and, old. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like all the technicians at Five DM. <laughs> <laughs> but we had technicians. We had four or five of them. Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> we did. <laughs> but there's Neil. You know, didn't know anything. I suppose much about me, but I knew everything I thought about him. And he's a said, nice man. I said to him, "What were your parents like?" Yeah. And he answered. This is the start of the interview. He answered, well, one was a man and one was a woman. (laughs) And I thought, oh, my God, is it going to be like this? Uh, But within 30 seconds we'd both found the level we wanted to talk to and it went on for for half an hour. Um, 
I never, I mean, I followed his career but never got in touch with his management mm. or anything until 1998 when I think he was visiting Adelaide for perhaps the fourth mm. or fifth time. Mm. He was at the entertainment centre and I left a note it's not a stage door at the entertainment centre, but the oh. you know where the, the the artists go in and out. I knew his manager's name, and I just left a note in an envelope saying, "I don't know whether you know Neil will ever remember me, but I did the first oh. phone interview with him in Australia." Oh. Uh, I got a call. He was here for three nights. I got a call back the second day from the manager saying. You will be our guest at the show and you'll come round and yeah. have dinner with us afterwards. He remembers Wonderful. that interview distinctly. Now, I don't know to this day whether he did. I think he did. Oh, well, that's wonderful. The conversation we had, yeah. he seemed to, you know, I didn't have to explain. No. Uh, but maybe he does that with a lot of people throughout the world. I doubt it. But it, it just brought a full circle for me yeah. and I felt, uh, you know, I'm... I didn't waste, you know, that time after all. Um, back in 1972, Astor Records, which was his label in Australia, oh, yeah. they bought the interview from 5 wow. n Wow, wow. We could have sold it for a lot more than we did, yeah. but it con- consequently got played all around Australia yeah. on music stations. Yeah. Um, and now, of course, I, you know, everybody knows that I guess that Neil Diamond is not well and yeah, I know. it's, you know, I just often think that, you know, why can't good people still make music? Oh, I know. Did you, uh, there are sort of disappointing ones that I can remember who really didn't sort of give very much or even want to do the interview. I remember uh, Robert Mitchum who simply said... I think he was notorious with everybody. Oh, well, I I heard was, that. it's like pulling teeth. Yeah. And the other one I remember was uh, Gordon Lightfoot and it was difficult for me because I, I worshipped him. I thought he was a, a wonderful talent. I loved his music and he just was, I don't know, bad mood or drunk or I don't know, but yeah. it was a very disappointing thing. And in the end I said to him, look, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. You obviously don't want to talk. You're not in the mood or whatever, but I wish you'd just say I didn't want to do the interview yeah, rather yeah. than rather than do that. He died but, earlier this year. Yes, I know, yeah. I know, I know, I know. He was um, a legend in Canada, of course. Speaking of uh, selling interviews back to America, or selling interviews back, do you remember that day in, when was it, uh, 77, I guess it would have been, uh, when you came in to me and said, um, there's a um, a siege. yes. And in the Brunei Brith building in Washington. And uh, here's the number. Do you, you want to cold call it? Mm. <coughs> we just, just not set up an mm. interview and just, just ring it. Mm. Do you remember that? Yes. How did you get that number? In the phone book, I guess. But it went, went straight to the terrorists who had taken over. Well, they'd taken over the phone, I suppose. The Brunei Brith building. I mean, there's no building. reason why an organisation like that should have... A secret number. They well, I don't know. I mean, knowing you, they, I wouldn't they, surprise me if you had. They should be trying to attract followers. <laughs> um, well, they were doing it at the point of a gun. <laughs> yes, I, I remember that day. And, and you got on the front page of the advertiser. Yes. Uh, as a result of that. Yeah. Well, um, no, that was thanks to you. Oh, well. You, uh, and I also got a nice award out of New York for that. And thanks to you. Oh, well, I don't know about that. You did the job. Yeah, well, the interesting thing, though, is uh, that today, of course, the FBI would immediately take the telephones out because what would happen would be some stupid FM jock yes. would ring and yes. probably exacerbate the situation and cause a, a, a worse uh, problem. But uh, I take it that that sort of thing wouldn't be wouldn't be done today. I've got the feeling that nobody would do well, it. I don't know because I'm not involved, but I I don't I mean I don't be honest with you, I don't listen to radio. Uh, oh, okay, that's I interesting. for a long long time. Interesting. I, I still know what's going on for yeah. some reason. You you don't have to listen to know what's going on. No. Um but I think I think radio has lost its adventure. Yeah. Maybe it's just the people who are running it. They, they, they are not sort of radio people. Well, you know, when I say that, I don't know what, you know, 
Mark Rusciuto and Chris Dittmar do on Triple M in the morning? I don't either. Well, they're number one. They must be doing something right. Yeah. They must be. Um, but I just feel somewhere along the way radio came to a... What's the word when you come? Oh, fork in the road. A divide, yes. Yeah. And I feel most radio stations took the wrong way. Yeah. They took the easy way out. Yeah. Some didn't. Some are still obviously, you know, yeah. in their own market, very successful. Yeah. Well, 2GB and 3AW and 4BC and 6PR, these are the talk stations in Well, these... 3AW's been there almost unchanged, if you like. Yeah. I mean, they've changed personalities. Yeah. But the format is still the same. They're now, as I understand it, obviously they're running a sports show like we did yeah, with but Ken Cunningham in 1978 yeah, yeah, in the yeah. afternoon, the yeah. same. Yes, yes. After all this time, yeah. in the last ten years, they've realised, mm -hmm. and Melbourne, far more sports-loving oh, yes. than Adelaide. Yeah, you sports know. mad. And well, I've, now perhaps they don't need all radio stations need to do it because there are now twenty four hour yep. sports stations. So. Anything you'd do differently today if you could go back and do it all oh, again? Of course, of course, of course. I mean, a lot of little things. There's no doubt about that. But mm. I mean, I certainly managed to get rid of Hawaii calls. <laughs> <laughs> That was a big success story. I went out to celebrate that. <laughs> but, no, I, uh, I, to, I suppose to try and be serious, um, it might well have been that I was a square peg in a round hole. Where, at the, at the end? Yes, I think so. I think oh. I would rather... I, on reflection, I would rather have been programming a, t a, a music station. Would you rather have been running 5DM? Oh, perhaps if that time had come, yes, I would have yeah. been manager. That would. That's well, different. you were the logical one to take over well, if that, Paul left. That, that's different, Jeremy. That's a, you know. But then, as manager, you're divorcing yourself from really all the fun and games. Mm -hmm. And I like the the fun and games side of it. It was yes, you know. You, you went home with a smile. Most days you went home with a smile on your face. Well, you were adventurous and you were mischievous. Well, you had to take risks. You had, we had yes. to because we were carving out a new niche in Adelaide Radio. Yes, yes. We were putting to air on Adelaide, yes. putting to air in Adelaide for the very first time what we were aiming to make an all-talk radio station. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, but with a monopoly, well, mind you, well, well, wasn't really a monopoly because Five AD started to do talk in the, the morning show, and they did oh, talk. Oh, well, Five AD was talking in the nineteen sixties in the morning. Yeah, yeah. You so know. it wasn't a monopoly. But yes, uh, it was. But to be a twenty-four hour talk station. Yes, yes. We never got there because midnight to dawn continued to be a music music station. Yeah. Um, shift. Yeah. Um, had we found, I don't know whether how serious I looked, I can't recall, but had I found the right person to talk. Yeah. All night, that would have finished off yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thing. But I thought my forte was in choosing the right records to play on radio. I think your forte was finding the right people. Well, that you can find the right people in any format. Yeah, but you've got to know where to look and you've got to know, know what to recognise uh, when you see it. Yes, you do, because mm. you... Jeremy, there's no rule book in radio. No. But doesn't that make it interesting? The... Exactly. Well, somebody else might get the rule book if there was a rule book. We don't no, want that. And those stations that <laughs> did operate by a rule book yeah. got bogged down in... The rules. The rules. Yeah. You had to be prepared to let it all hang out, to use the 70s expression. Yeah. Take a risk. expression. Yeah. Live uh, dangerously. Yes, not to the point where, you know, it would all come crashing in on you. No. You, you had to have the, the knowledge which I think I did. Yeah, well, it never did with us. Yeah, no, you, you had to have the knowledge. To... Graham Kennedy said this to me once, and I've never forgotten it, and mm. it applies not just to the way he was a television star, but it mm. applies to what I write for the newspaper, it applies to what you say in front of a microphone. You've got to have the knowledge to go to the edge but mm. never go over. Mm. Mm. And I believe... I've always had that. Yeah.
Now, in, the, in, in doing that, you're bound to ruffle a few feathers. You're bound to. Oh, well, that's just that's the some job. Some people don't want you to get anywhere near the edge. <laughs> yeah. But unless you take mm. that chance, yeah. you're going to die a thousand boring cuts from a thousand boring <laughs> cuts. You are. Yeah. You've got to suddenly say, hey, this is going to make your ears pop up. Yep, yep. Yeah, you don't want to bore the audience. I mean, that's the one, one it's, terrible it's crime. The, the same thing with, with surveys. You said to me, do you remember what the survey was with Ken Cunningham when it came out the next day or next week? I don't remember, Jeremy, and I probably don't remember because I paid hardly any attention the survey. to the surveys. Oh, interesting. Yeah. The survey was the results were what was in my head. Mm. And... Some guy in America told to me this, that the best survey you can have is to catch the bus in the morning mm -hmm. and listen to what people are talking about. Yeah, yeah. And Isn't then you put true? those subjects yeah. on the air that day. Yes. How wise the survey system was in Adelaide, in, in Australia, in the 1970s, I really don't know. No. Uh, and I still think whatever, however they do it now for television or radio, it's probably still subject to a lot of fluctuations mm. that, that they perhaps build build in, mm. you know, room, error. For, room for error. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Is it true that Bob Francis gave you your first break? Um, well, yes and no. Um, <laughs> Bob became a very close friend of mine. Yeah. When I was a schoolboy, yeah. for some reason he embraced me. He could see in me, I think, the future. Well, you're an old soul. Well, I, I used to go in after school. He was then broadcasting at 5AD. What school did you go to? St Peter's College. But That's I nice. don't often say that because I didn't like much of my time there. None of us ever I used would to come like home school. And, I used to come home and beg my parents to send me to Unley High, which was just yeah. up the road. Mm. They would not only have... Well, mm. good school. Yeah. They would not only have a better son, but they would be saving a fortune. Yes, indeed. But for some reason they decided yeah, that yeah, I would yeah. continue going there and... Anyway, um, Bob went to Prince Alfred College. So mm. Perhaps we had that in common that we mm. were private schoolboys. Um, but when Bob went to 5AD, because he was with 5DN, Jeremy. Oh, yes, back in the years, very years, early. Years, yeah, 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 5DN's yeah. kind of original yeah. popular music person. Yes, DJ. Then, yeah, DJ. And then 5AD yeah. took him and turned him into a monster. <laughs> and, it, you know, it just grew from there. Yeah. But I would go in after school. I mean, this is in the days when there was no security. No. And I would sit there in the studio with him yeah. and tell him mm. what to say. <laughs> Lovely. And he, he did it. Yeah, yeah. And loved it. He yeah. loved the fact. And in those days I was ringing radio stations in America, ringing disc jockeys in America just to talk. To get ideas. And Was that to, not to talk on air? But oh, to not talk. to talk on air. No, just to ring them and say I'm, I'm supporting a disc jockey here in Adelaide. Yeah. What, what can you we do? You did the research. Yeah. You remind me of Caleb Bond. No, but, well, I don't know whether that's good or bad, yeah. Jeremy, because well, I, <laughs> I, I know Caleb, you know. Yeah, well, I, I, he um, used to ring me when he was 11 years old. I, yes, I don't think I'm like Caleb, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's fine, you know. I think we're very different. Yeah. But anyway, that's your opinion and that's fine. Is that it's different politically but, 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 or what? Oh, no, just... I, no, we won't. Okay. We'll, we'll leave Caleb out. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right, all right. He's fine. Um, yeah. But Bob and I became good friends mm. and I went to his first wedding mm. and, you know, as a schoolboy. Sure. And I kept in touch with him pretty much till the day he yes, yes. died. Yes, yes. Well, you were sort of starstruck he, with he, him as I was starstruck with John Laws. I won't say I was starstruck, Jeremy, but I would say I was... Bob was lazy. Oh, yeah. And I was fulfilling a role mm. for him, which nobody else at 5AD seemed to be doing. No, no. He, I mean, he was only paying me in free records. Okay. 
That's the payment I got. Have you still got that great record collection? No, it's all gone. Oh, all good. Gone. Um, but, you know, I've heard so many people say so many things about Bob. Most of them yeah. kind. Yes. But I, I grew up with him. Yeah. You know, I was younger than his... I don't know. I mean, I just... His son hadn't been born, but... I felt at the time I was mm. a sort of a son Close. to him, yeah. you know, but he was only 20 yeah. and I was 47, I was 14. Yes. It was, a, it was a weird friendship but it worked on all levels. See, you should write the book, you know. You should well, write the book. he wrote about me in his book. Yeah, well, I haven't read his book but I'd certainly like to read yours. Well, you won't because it's, <laughs> it's not coming. <laughs> well, I, can, I can't tell you what a great joy it is to have you oh, as a special guest on this program. End? Okay. There's no, just, there's no end. It just rolls stay. on. <laughs> well, you're more than welcome to stay. I'll come back another time. I'd love you to do that. I will do that because I, I don't often do this. No, I know and I, I had to persuade you. Oh, well, every time you rang I was unwell or something. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. It was all genuine, Jeremy. I know. Look, I know, I know, but... Uh, I'm just very privileged to have I, ac- access no, to you. I'm much more relaxed about talking about me now since the editor of The Advertiser has encouraged me to write about me. Right. There was a time for a long time then when I didn't want to... Mm. I wasn't hiding. It, it just didn't seem to me to be, mm. you know, worthwhile or interesting enough. But if anybody has convinced me now that I should have a bit more to say, it's her, mm-hmm. and I'm very grateful for that and I'm grateful that you've maintained our friendship for so long too. You... Oh, look, I, I love you dearly. I'd love you to, uh, that book there, I, I, I salvaged that when uh, I left 5DN and it's a, a, bo- a, a visitor's book, uh, but I have got all sorts of wonderful people over the years who have come in and graced the studio and talked to me. I remember the 5DN Visitors book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, think that was my idea. Well, look, it probably was. I think every damn good idea that we had at DN I was do. an idea that you had. That wasn't the old one. That uh, one was the restarted. Oh. Oh, oh was that the rebooted one? Oh, no, no. We, we had one back in the 70s. Oh, that should have gone into the time capsule. Mm-hmm. Yeah, should have, absolutely. But there are all sorts of guests and people who wandered in and wandered out. Lovely. I'd love you to sign that. Thank you very much. Marty. Thank you, Jeremy. Love you dearly. I'll come back another time. God bless you. Do you want to make a real impact in your community? Sponsor Jeremy Cordo's The Court of Public Opinion and be a part of something special. Connect with engaged listeners, showcase your brand and support informed discussions. Yes. Oh, look, I've been loving watching it. It's uh, Truly, it's a true breath of fresh air. Oh, well, I'm glad you found me. Make your mark on Jeremy Cordo's The Court of Public Opinion, where voices matter. Jeremy, I think it's wonderful that you're able to do this because you have such wonderful history. You have a great connection with your audience. There are still many, many, many people who love you and it's just great that you and others who may be in a similar position who aren't working for a commercial station anymore can do it and continue to do what they love doing and not just for you but for the listeners sponsorship opportunities are limited act now and be part of the conversation please join us we'd love to have you simply visit jeremycordo.com and click on sponsor